Washoe County Library System welcomes you to the first presentation in our new monthly series from the Historic Reno Preservation Society. Tonight's topic is Alice Ramsey's Journey presented by Debbie Hinman. My name is Samantha and I'm so happy to be here with you today. Washoe County Library System and Historic Reno Preservation Society will feature a different topic and speaker the first Tuesday of every month through April. And now I would like to introduce you to Carol Coleman with the Historic Reno Preservation Society. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Hello there, uh, I'm Carol Coleman. I'm currently president of Historic Reno Preservation Society or HARPS as we call ourselves. I hope you're all staying safe and well out there during this COVID time. Uh, I wanna thank the Washoe County Library and technology like Zoom for allowing us to continue to bring these kinds of programs to you. We're in the process now of looking at how we do our walking tours and our home tour for the rest of the year. And depending on the situation, we'll either be back doing things on Zoom or maybe we'll be with you live again. So I hope you enjoy the program. I hope you watch what's on the website, and this will also be recorded on the HARPS website. So enjoy the program. Now I'm going to turn you over to Sherry Hayes Zorn. She's the co chair for programs and is bringing this to you. Sherry? Thank you, Carol. Hello, everybody, and thank you again so much for signing up for our wonderful programs. And we hope you've been enjoying them via Zoom. And we're going we'll to be working towards uh, getting new programming scheduled for this fall. And as Carol mentioned, it might be in person or by Zoom, but we really do wanna thank the library for being such supporters for our organization. So today we have a wonderful lecture and I imagine many of you maybe have heard of Alice Ramsey, but this is a wonderful program about Alice's journey and how she was a 22 year old woman crossing the country in 59 days. Our wonderful guest speaker is Debbie Hinman and she is a Reno native as well as a UNR graduate. And if anybody is a HARPS member, definitely knows Debbie as being a wonderful researcher and everything that you learn about with our home tours that uh, research has been done by Debbie and coming to the Historic Society in, in actually as well. But she right now is always as a researcher, but she's the editor and the um, and kind of the editor for our footprints, our quarterly publication. So without further ado, let me introduce Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much, Sherry, for the introduction. So this is the story of Alice Ramsey, uh, as Sherry mentioned, the first woman to drive an automobile across the country. The year was 1909, and Alice was just 22 years old. To give a little background on the automobile in this era, in 1909, only 155,000 Americans owned automobiles out of a total population of 80 million people. But what began as a fad in this decade grew into a feeling that makers and owners of horseless carriages were onto something. The automobile's popularity grew as publicity increased around long distance racing, such as the New York to Paris race with the Thomas Flyer pictured here. As I'm sure most of you know, this car resides at Reno's National Automobile Museum. Alice was the first woman, but the first person to undertake the journey was a Canadian born Vermont resident, Horatio Nelson Jackson in 1903. He did it in reverse of Alice's route from San Francisco to New York, driving a slightly used two-cylinder, 20-horsepower Winton, making the trip in 63 days, 12 hours, and 30 minutes. Jackson, having taken driving lessons in San Francisco, but having no mechanical experience, invited a young mechanic named Sewell Crocker to accompany him on this adventure. In Idaho, the men acquired a third road companion, a pit bull named Bud. The story of Horatio's drive became a Ken Burns film. So who was Alice? 
She was born Alice Taylor Wheeler, November 11th, 1886 in Rochester, New York. Alice's father loved to tinker and she helped him as a child showing great aptitude. After grade school, Alice elected to take manual training rather than the traditional more feminine arts. Alice attended Vassar in an era when fewer than 7% of women went to college. Alice married John Rathbone, known as Bone Ramsey in 1907 and have a son, John Jr. He was more than twice her age, a congressman from New Jersey. The couple lived in Hackensack, New Jersey. John loved to indulge his young wife. One day, Alice asked to take their horse-drawn carriage out alone. Duke the horse was suddenly spooked and Alice had to fight to maintain control. Upon hearing about the stare, Bone offered to buy Alice an automobile instead. She considered and then agreed. Alice began taking driving lessons and progressed so quickly that she logged 6,000 miles over the summer. Alice decided to enter the Montauk Point Reliability Run in September of 1908. The only other woman driver was a woman named June Cuneo in a Rainier. The run was a 200 mile trip on rough roads. There, Alice met Carl Kelsey, a Maxwell automobile representative. He had her take the lead in the second leg of the race. That night at dinner, Kelsey had a challenge for Alice, which would also be a publicity coup for himself. He proposed she drive the Maxwell from Hellgate, Manhattan, New York, to San Francisco. When Alice's sisters-in-law, Maggie and Nettie, heard the idea, they were thrilled Alice was considering it and they wanted to go too. Bone was at first less than enthusiastic, but seeing how excited Alice was, he relented on the condition that his sisters accompany her. Alice's next challenge was the, woman, the women's New York to Philadelphia run. She entered the race accompanied by her 16-year-old friend, Hermine Johns. Alice won first prize. Alice then invited Hermine to join the other three women, women on their grand adventure. So this is the Maxwell, um, although Alice's was green, um, but this is the car and some of the statistics of the car. The ladies could only take one suitcase apiece and think how much room the long full skirts would have taken up in those suitcases. Alice told the others that spare parts and tools were far more important than clothes. She also packed her new Kodak. Alice was advised not to take a weapon. Maxwell fitted the vehicle with a 20 gallon tank instead of the usual 14 due to the vast distances between towns in the West. The vehicle was also equipped with a side rack for spare tires and the car was a right hand drive. Here you can see what Alice's car looked like. So this is the crew um, on that morning in Manhattan before they took off on their journey. Nettie was the elder of both sisters and um, Mag she was the more outgoing one. Maggie was quieter. They were proper ladies, however, always fastidiously attired. Well, except when they would be driving in a downpour, as it was in Manhattan that morning. They had on their ponchos and their white, their white brimmed hats. Hermine had just moved to Hackensack to live with her sister, and that's how she came to know Alice. This slide shows some statistics of the women's journey. There were very few paved roads. In fact, only 152 miles. So they were mostly dirt and wagon trails that they would be following. Most of the route the ladies took would become the Lincoln Highway, which was conceived of in 1912 by Indiana entrepreneur Carl Fisher and formally dedicated in 1913. Travel essentials, blue books, although this one is, appears to be black, 
<laughs> we're guides to certain sections of our states, and we're almost indispensable for road travelers. Said Alice, the dependable blue book with its accurate mileages from one town to another and detailed instructions on where to turn or which fork in the road to choose was nearly as necessary as gasoline in the fuel tank. Roadmaps were not yet invented. AAA had only been in existence for five years. Blue books were written in terms of mileages between identifiable buildings, distinctive trees, or other natural markers. They began with New York State and then New England, and then one by one other sections of the country were added. By 1909, they extended only to the Missouri River. Also indispensable on the journey were the helpful representatives who worked for the Maxwell Company across the country. They accompanied the women in their own vehicle. They accompanied, they accompanied them through challenging situations. They ordered replacement parts and delivered them to the vehicle when needed. So here we are back again to departure day in Manhattan. It was pouring. Even in the rain, there was a large crowd that saw the ladies off. Alice was happy to see June Cuneo, her earlier competitor. And there was a quote in the New York Times that day denouncing the women for attempting to perform the work of men. The weather was miserable for most of this leg. Alice used chains for the slippery roads, which she would install herself. In Albany, they were met by J.D. Murphy, the advance agent, publicity man, and automotive editor of the Boston Herald. He was to travel ahead of the ladies, usually by train, arrange their accommodations, and write about their trip. Initially, Alice was a little apprehensive, but she liked him immediately, and he remained a longtime friend. The women rusted, rested in Buffalo and visited Niagara Falls. Arriving in Auburn, New York, the women were invited to tour the Auburn State Prison by Warden Benham. They thought it was an odd but interesting invitation and so accepted. Alice missed the turn to Cleveland due to a discrepancy in the blue book. The instruction said to turn at the yellow house, but the women saw no yellow houses. When they stopped for directions, they were told that the house's owner, a farmer, had painted his yellow house green, being again horseless vehicles. He had told his neighbor, now you watch. We'll have us some fun with them automobile drivers. The ladies acquired quite a parade of vehicles behind them when driving into Cleveland. One driver had four buttons on the side of his car, which played bugle sounding notes as the horn. He worked for the Gabriel Company and offered to have one installed on the Maxwell, which Alice accepted, thinking it would be a fun way to herald their arrival in each town. Alice reported in her journal, worked up the terrific speed of 42 miles per hour on the Cleveland Parkway, our record so far. Wrote Alice in her journal, back in grade school, we had learned that Chicago was a large railroad center. Our entrance into the Windy City reinforced this lesson. For miles and miles, we crossed tracks. Singly, in pairs, and in groups, going back and forth, we wound around and over them until we were almost dizzy and wondered if there would ever be an end. Bump, bump, up and down, again and again. Springs were sturdy or they never would have endured such jouncing. Here's a photograph of Chicago in 1909. The women marveled at the metropolis with its splendid new buildings, just over 20 years since the great fire. At the hotel, they were able to get their clothes clean and hair washed. It was a glorious sensation, they reported. Alice did all the driving. Um, in fact, the other four, three women, none of them even knew how to drive. She also did most of her road repairs, minor road repairs, and she changed her tires. Changing a tire in Rochelle, Illinois, the men in the pilot vehicle offered to do it for her. Uh, she said, no, I can do it but she did let them pump up the tire. And along the way, Alice also gave the other ladies instructions on how to change the tire in case she needed assistance. 
the if you can't read the little um, caption below the second picture, it says Alice slithered through the muddy morass in Iowa for mile upon mile in low gear. DeKalb, Illinois, instructed Alice to the other ladies, was the home of Joseph Glidden, inventor of barbed wire in 1873. Alice called it that diabolical instrument of Lucifer, if you caught your skirt or trousers on it, Mark remarked Alice. Here you see the post office in, of DeKalb, Illinois, um, and they admired its handsome copper dome. Alice found the long and narrow wooden planked bridge somewhat intimidating. As they crossed, silence reigned in the car. Alice kept reminding herself that the bridge had been there for many springs, and there was no reason why it should choose this particular time to collapse. Heavy rain turned already poor roads into primitive trails, bordered by water-filled ditches. The gas tank of the Maxwell was located under the front seat. To check the fuel level, they had to remove the cushion and all personal belongings and use a stick marked off in inches. Because of the rain and the driving issues, Alice had forgotten to check the gas level. This is the only time they ran out on the entire trip. Had she had to go back to a farmer's to make a call. From then on, they carried a five gallon container with them. The sisters, as I already mentioned, were very fastidious and they had packed cut glass containers for their creams and such in their travel kits. But these containers became very useful vessels for carrying water from streams to the radiator. One day along the way, they met a lone woman in a farm wagon who said she had driven six miles and waited a long time at the crossroads in hopes of seeing the women driving from New York to California. They spent that night by a stream that was too swollen with rain to cross. Their dinner was bread and butter with sugar from their hamper. Told that the roads were worse on ahead, Alice was advised to put the car on a flatbed car and ship it to Omaha. Alice would not hear of it. She felt it would be cheating. However, she did agree to lighten the load by having her companions and their luggage take a train to the nearest town. JD rode with Alice to assist if needed. As Alice and JD approached Danger Hill, a steep climb with a sharp 90 degree turn at the bottom, a car ahead of them was stuck on the upgrade. JD and Alice offered to pull them to the top with a rope tied to the two vehicles. Alice carefully maneuvered alongside the stuck vehicle, passed it, and towed it up the hill. Alice did her best over the next few miles of one mud hole after another, but they soon found themselves stuck. Alice drove while JD wedged a nearby fence post under a rear wheel. As the wheels spun in the mud, JD was splattered from head to toe. Here's a wonderful illustration of this event by Don Brown. And later on, I'll show you um, a picture of the book that he wrote uh, for young adults called Alice Ramsey's Grand Adventure. Don wrote the book and did the illustrations. They spent the night in Vail, then decided they would need to bypass Omaha altogether as the road was impassable. Just as they set out for Sioux City, while climbing a slight incline, the rear axle broke. Not wanting to leave the vehicle, Alice created a tent with her duster and sat under it on the side of the road, catching up her journal and expense accounts until the new axle arrived by train. Here's a postcard I found online of downtown Sioux City. Now this was taken July 10th, 1909, and Alice arrived there July 2nd. The card depicts the corner of West 6th Street and quite appropriately, Water Street. The crew back together, they were delayed in Ogallala, <laughs> Nebraska, when a mounted posse searched for an escaped killer. They later heard that a local man in his cabin had been robbed and killed. Later, a man and woman were noticed in a nearby town throwing around a lot of cash. 
The victim's dog, injured in the attack, was brought to where the couple was being held and without hesitation leaped to attack them. This was considered watertight ter testimony. The ladies arrived in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Cheyenne was a true frontier town with wood frame buildings, dirt streets, cowboys and Indians. It was fascinating for the Eastern ladies to see. This is a postcard of their frontier day, um, which the ladies weren't there to see, but it gives you an idea of what the town looked like in that day. There was one nice hotel where the women could rest, bathe, and pick up long awaited mail. This was a difficult stretch due to unmarked roads, washouts, and gullies. The women devised a novel way of climbing up the sides of deep gullies. Alice would gun the engine while her companions would lodge rocks or blocks of wood under the wheels. She would gun it again, move forward a little, and the process would be repeated. When the blue books weren't helpful, Alice followed railroad tracks and telegraph wires, hoping to be led to the next town. Out of Rock Springs, the road ended suddenly and the vehicle was forced to cross the Platte River on a railroad trestle as the bridge had washed out. However, the station was at the other end of the trestle. Alice wrote, the problem was to get a permit to do something we would have to do before we could get the permit. What a crazy world. So Nettie, Maggie, and Hermine walked across the station, walked across to the station. And once they had permission, they waved to Alice and she drove over it alone, one bump at a time. The ladies doubled up when they got the chance for a hotel. The sisters would share a room as would Alice and Hermine. That night at the Opal Hotel, Alice was awakened by Hermine thrashing about. Alice asked what the matter was and Hermine said she didn't know, but she was itching all over. Alice sprang out of bed and lit the lamp. Her worst fears were confirmed, bed bugs. The women spent the night in the hotel office downstairs, sitting in chairs with their heads resting on the table. When the staff came in the next morning, they saw the women there and never said a word. Next, the women arrived in Salt Lake City. Here was a big enough city that they could get the Maxwell checked out and repairs made in preparation for the steep climbs ahead. They stayed several days in Salt Lake. They visited the Mormon Tabernacle. Um, they felt it was a beautiful town with wide, clean streets. The repairs took longer than expected, so Alice and her crew got to visit the Great Salt Lake and, as she said in her journal, have a swim in the fantastically buoyant water where it is hard to keep a man down. Mr. Sam Sharman, the state representative for Maxwell, would guide them to Reno in his two-cylinder roadster. The women had breakfast the next morning in a small outpost called Fish Springs. There was no restaurant, just a general store in an adobe building. The proprietor told them he could only offer them dry cereal, tomatoes, canned tomatoes, and coffee. The women felt it was all part of their adventure and ate with gusto. Alice was warned of rougher, reds ahead, rougher roads ahead. It was time again to lighten the load. Along the way, there were an abundance of prairie dog holes Alice was intrigued by the little animals and tried to get photographs of them, but they were too crafty for her, shooting down one hole and popping up in another some distance away. At any rate, Alice's passengers took a stagecoach to Ely. Alice drove the distance with Maxwell rep Sam Sharman. Arriving at the hotel in Ely, Nettie, the sports fan, was excited as she got to meet Tex Rickard, who was a prominent fight promoter in the day who was staying at the same hotel. When Alice met up with her companions, they took a stroll through the streets of Ely. The women had raved about a Chinese launderer named Charlie, who did a fabulous job of cleaning all of their clothes, and they wanted to show Alice where his laundry was.
Charlie worked in front of a large window. As the women watched, Charlie began to iron a shirt. Then he took a swallow from a glass of water and sprayed the shirt with his mouth. The women were speechless. Alice later caught Nettie rinsing out her nightdress. Back on the road to Eureka, the women were frozen in fear by a sudden sight. Over a hill came a dozen Indians, naked from the waist up, carrying drawn bows and arrows, emitting war whoops. As they sat frozen, a jackrabbit came tearing across the road in front of the auto, followed by the Indians, who paid no attention at all to the women. We gave forward one glorious sigh of relief when we discovered the object of their hunt was a poor desert animal instead of poor Eastern females, wrote Alice. They were given the oddest breakfast of all at the Walsh Ranch. The fare was lamb chops and chocolate cake. The women spent the night in Rawhide, which was formerly an active mining town, now running down. The women were looking forward to staying in Reno the next evening. Here is a wonderful depiction of the women in their Maxwell crossing the Nevada desert by artist and muralist John Tan. Some of you may recognize this and remember it. It used to um, be painted on the side of a small brick building near the corner of Sierra Street and West Liberty. Unfortunately, several years ago, the maquette was lost when the small brick building was demolished. Today, it's a gravel lot. When they came into view of Sparks, this is what Alice wrote in her journal. The image that is most vivid in my mind was the unexpected view as we drove over the mountain in the late evening and looked upon the little city of Sparks. I think I shall never forget the surprise of that vista bursting upon us in the darkness. Here was a hollow in which lay a community brilliantly lighted with electricity. Right off the dark and barren desert, this almost bowled us over. It was situated only a couple of miles from Reno and was connected to it by trolley. Surprise, surprise, suddenly we had returned to civilization. The ladies would spend the night at the Riverside Hotel. They had hoped for a quiet rest, but as Alice wrote, the greetings of the Sacramento and San Francisco Maxwellites on hand to lead us on our final lap to the Golden Gate, could be heard above the rushing waters of the Truckee River flowing by the side of the building. And our spirits, in spite of the hour and our long day, were happy and bright as the dawn. The next morning they got up and drove to Carson City and had lunch in a Japanese restaurant across from the Capitol. After lunch, they were on their way to Lake Tahoe via Kings Canyon Road, which Alice proclaimed was not meant for automobiles. The women camped on the south shore of Lake Tahoe. Writes Don Brown, the Sierra Nevada mountains towered before them, Alice's last great obstacle. She steered the Maxwell up the steep path. The road snaked back and forth up the mountain. The car struggled on the incline and the engine became hot. Alice lifted the hood to cool the motor and rested the Maxwell at each turn. It took them eight hours to travel 70 miles. Alice noted that the California roads were the best they had encountered since leaving the East Coast. From Sacramento to Oakland, the women attracted a sizable escort of enthusiastic automobilists. The Golden Gate Bridge wouldn't be built for another 27 years, so the Maxwell was loaded onto a ferry, and the women excitedly anticipated their arrival in San Francisco. Here's another of Don Brown's drawings from his book. The women were met by a cavalcade of escorting Maxwells. Crowds had gathered to welcome the women at the end of their journey. The date was August 7th just 59 days from that rainy Manhattan departure. So what happened to Alice? Alice returned to Hackensack, New Jersey to Bone and her son, and the following year gave birth to a daughter. 
but she never lost her love of driving. In 1919, just 10 years after her first trip, Alice drove an overland across the country. In fact, she drove cross country annually and sometimes more frequently. She was honored by AAA on the 50th anniversary of her first drive. In 1961, she wrote the account of her journey, Veil, Duster, and Tire Iron. You can see a copy of the book cover here. Alice died September 10th, 1983 at the age of 96. There's a photograph of her holding her book. Information from this presentation came from Alice's Drive, um, which was written by Gregory Francois. And what he did was he took Alice's original book and annotated it and added a lot of photographs and um, other um, footnotes uh, to talk about how the drive compared today with how the, the ladies drive went in 1909. It's a fantastic book, really interesting. Um, and then this is the cover of Dan Brown's book for young adults, Alice Ramsey's Grand Adventure, which he wrote in 1977. I have a brief postscript to this. In 2003, a man by the name of Richard Anderson, who was a collector of vintage cars, got the idea to find a Maxwell identical to Alice's, restore it, and do so by 2009 for his daughter, Emily. He only found one Maxwell still in existence, and it was not for sale. Undeterred, Anderson began combing the country for parts, and he built an entire, pretty much identical vehicle by 2009. He convinced Emily to recreate Alice's journey. Emily chose to do portions of the drive accompanied by her young daughter, Tessa. Her 31-day jaunt mirrored the slow-go route taken by Alice Ramsey. I actually got to meet um, the Andersons and uh, Emily. Um, a friend had a little picnic for them, so it was really fun because I had just written the story for Footprints about uh, Alice's journey. And so it was exciting to, uh, to talk to Emily about her recreating the journey. Emily, 37, set out to remind people that women were pushing boundaries on men's turf long before they even got the vote in this country. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Debbie. That was really great. You're um, welcome. <laughs> there was a question, Debbie. Uh, there, you had mentioned that Alice had driving lessons or training when she first got her car. Was there any kind of licensure or vehicle registration back then? Do you know? You know, I don't know. I don't recall reading anything about that in the book. Okay. Um, I think you just learn to drive and <laughs> hopefully and, and uh, took off. So no driving. I do know that when she had her second driving lesson, um, her driving instructor had to go through New York City, um, upstate a ways to pick up something. And he said, how would you like to drive me? He was that impre impressed with how well she did um, on her first lesson. And you can imagine cars were a lot more difficult to learn to drive in those days. They had a lot more to manage than just uh, like our automatic vehicles today. There were many gears. <laughs> no, nothing yes. like what we have today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in in 1926 here in Reno, they had a celebration of the completion of the road uh, from Nevada to California. The Transcontinental Highway, yes. So how was it that she was able to drive in 1909 if the road wasn't completed until 1926? Because it wasn't a road. It was just rutted wagon trails and uh, you know various trails that people had made across great expanses. And that's why they kept getting stuck all the time. Um, so it wasn't an official road, but as I said earlier, it, it eventually became the Lincoln Highway. It was traced about the same route across the country. No. Yeah. Did she indicate what car her husband bought her in 1908? Oh my gosh. Um, 
wasn't she a did but i can't remember it was a little red car um, a little red car yes i thought all cars were black in 1908 <laughs> well the picture i saw of it was red but maybe it was a later picture of the same car and somebody had painted it red oh okay <laughs> But no, it was it was a small car. It wasn't anything as grand as the Maxwell. Okay. Um, Debbie, uh, mm -hmm. Francine Maxine said she loved your presentation and she didn't know anything about this journey. Um, um, let's see. Uh, Ginny Curser, Curson, uh, said my mother was from Hackensack and knew who she was. Oh um, my gosh! Oh. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So. One thing I noticed was when they were taking off from Manhattan, uh, I guess you need it to take off you, all those flowers they had with them. They gave them all these bouquets of pink carnations and <laughs> they didn't know what to do with them, you know? So I think they just sort of threw them out on their way. You know, they didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But... Let me see, we have a question from Jenny Kersey. Uh, Samantha? Could you could you make Jenny Kersey a co-host for the moment so that she can speak? You're okay, Jenny, you're up if you I'm unmuted, yes. If you can unmute, you can talk. Yes, I was going to say I the reason I was so fascinated with this story tonight, I heard about about Alice Ramsey several a number of years ago and I read the book. Oh, did you? So yeah, and so then I I called my mother, um, and she, my mother, my family was from Hackensack. My mother was born in Hackensack in 1913. And so I asked her about if she ever had ever heard of Alice Ramsey. And she said, oh, yeah, she was the woman who drove a car. <laughs> so, How neat. so she was probably pretty young when she saw her driving a car. So oh it was quite gosh. the thing. And yeah, a great so, story. And with a child yeah. left at home, that was uh, that that was impressive. Quite the thing, yeah. In that era, that's for sure. Yeah, they were quite wealthy. I'm sure they had a nanny. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I don't think Bone took responsibility for her, for him. <laughs> it looks like there's a, a question about how did they prepare for parts and fuel along the trip. They were lucky to have all of these representatives from Maxwell. Um, you know, either a pilot car or driving along behind them. Um, so they were there to assist them. Um, okay. But Alice, of course, being strong-minded, really didn't want their help unless she absolutely had to have it. Uh -huh. So she tried to take care of most things herself. Yeah. But there were times when parts, you know, were when the car broke down and they needed to stop somewhere and order parts. And at least the Maxwell people were there to take care of that. Uh -huh. They couldn't just pull out their cell phone and, and make a call. So, <laughs> so <Not> Debbie, <laughs> no, uh, Debbie asking about that, um, as you were reading about the journey, what was her longest breakdown? You know, cause you said they had to kind of wait sometimes for parts. So I think the axle, I think when they broke the axle, that took maybe about three or four days. Okay. Which still, you know, in that time, you know, was probably pretty good, but they probably loaded it on a train. Okay. I think that's what they did and shipped it to them. And then, you know, one of the Maxwell guys rode it out to where the car was broken down and okay. uh, fixed the axle. Oh. Alice didn't fix the axle. <laughs> so for 1909, there must have been quite a few Maxwell dealerships in yeah. across the country. Yeah. I always think Ford was what was there, but... <laughs> Actually, I think I heard once there were many, many cars, like a like hundred different kind of cars that were made in that era, and they've all gone by the wayside. Such is life. This was very interesting, Deb. Thank you. Glad, glad you could do it, and thanks for all the research. Sure. Um, Debbie, there is another question. Um, do you know if uh, what kind of specific mechanical repairs Alice was able to do herself? You said, you know, like change tires and, you know, I'm sure change oils and things, but. Yeah, uh, things like that, just minor that didn't involve, um, you know, too much mechanical knowledge, although she was pretty good mechanically. Um, but no, I don't know details of exactly which things she could do and which things she couldn't. Okay. Interesting. 
I wonder if there were fan belts in those days. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Things like that to change. I love the measuring stick for the gas. You know? Oh, yeah. That must have been a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, we better pull over to move the cushion. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. impressive, you know. <laughs> Obviously, there was no gas gauge in those days. <laughs> well, I think we want to thank you and probably turn it back over to Samantha. Thank you for doing this for uh, Harps. Yes, welcome. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Samantha and John, too, for all your assistance. You You're made it welcome. easy for me. Great. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Debbie Hinman, Carol Coleman, and Sherry Hayes Zorn with the Historic Reno Preservation Society and John, our Washoe County Library Systems Tech Wizard for making this event possible today. Don't forget to sign up for the next live Historic Reno Preservation Society event on Tuesday, February 2nd at 5.30. The topic will be Jeff Schumancher discusses fact, fiction, and Howard Hughes. And to sign up, you will visit events.washingtoncountylibrary.us. To see what's coming up, you can go to our page and visit events at .washingtoncountylibrary.us, where you can access all our uh, information and download our virtual explorer, which is a publication listing of all our virtual events and resources. Thanks for everybody for coming and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks.